Hey guys and welcome back to a new video and today we are going to talk about Android architecture specifically about clean architecture in use cases because I know that clean architecture and specifically use cases is always kind of a buzzword in the Android bubble something you will inevitably stumble over when just learning Android architecture but maybe if you're already following me for a while you maybe know that I am not the biggest fan of use cases on Android and therefore as well not of clean architecture in general. And the main reason why I am not is not that the original idea of use cases is bad, but because the typical implementation, how Android developers interpret how they should use and implement use cases in the project is just totally off. And this just leads to terrible architectures in the vast majority of Android code bases that use clean architecture and use cases. So in this video, I will show you with a clear practical example why I think that way on the one hand and which change we need to make in our architecture in this common misunderstanding in order to make use cases really useful in Android. And if you're interested in those architecture topics in general, uh, then good news for you, because all my premium courses are currently 25% off during Easter sale until Easter Monday, so for one week when this video comes online. I will include a link down below. The discount is already applied in checkout. If you want to improve in architecture and you want a specific course recommendation, check out the Android Essentials Bundle, because that really goes over all that multi-module architectural planning approach where you build a really, really big app. So let's first of all understand what the common understanding from Android developers is about what a use case should do. The common understanding is that a use case is just a class that should wrap a single little piece of logic. Because then people tell you, if we have a class that wraps the single piece of a little logic, like for example here, deleting a digit use case, that's actually an example that uh, one member from my uh, mobile dev campus community inspired me to make this video about. Since there we have regular app development challenges and the winner always gets a code review from me. And uh, there I saw an example like this, where I already shared my feedback in that community, but I also want to share it with you because I think it's uh, quite important. So here we have a delete digit use case. And typically a use case on Android, if you see this, it's just a class, might have a constructor, has a single public function to execute this. Some people might also override the invoke operator to, to call this like a, a function, even though it's a class. But in the end, what most people think a use case should do is it gets certain inputs and then executes a very modular piece of logic. Like here, for example, dropping a digit from this pin. And the arguments behind why it makes sense to design your code like this from these people who applied this pattern is always the same. Number one, this class follows the single responsibility principle. It has just a single responsibility. Maybe you've heard before that this, um, that following this principle makes sense because a class should only have a single reason to change. The goal with that is that the class stays modular and it's much, much more easy to combine different classes in different types of contexts to achieve a certain result. Main argument number two, why people stick to use cases is they make your code testable and specifically your business logic. So if you want to test Removing a digit in this case, you would just create an instance of this class in your test case, execute it with some kind of sample pin, and then you would check, okay, is the output actually the sample pin with the last digit being removed? That is how you would test that. It's of course super easy in this case. So what's the problem with this? This is certainly very modular code. This is certainly code that is easy to test. And this is certainly code that also does follow the single responsibility principle. The problem is that lots of Android developers completely misunderstand the original purpose of what use cases should be and what business logic actually is. So we've all already heard about, hey, use cases need to implement business logic, but then people think something like this would be business logic, but it isn't. So not every single piece of isolated logic is considered business logic. Why is it actually called business logic in the first place? Why do we call it business logic? Well, because every single piece of software is built around a certain type of business. And with that, I don't strictly mean that there must be some money involved, but the business of your app is in the end the domain it operates in. So if we're developing a social network app, then there are just certain concepts that we want to implement in this app that come from the real world, that, that come from the business itself kind of. So for example, that we have a user. We need to define what a user actually consists of because that's something the code doesn't inherently know. That's always something that is very specific to our specific social network app. So a user on Twitter might consist of different data than a user on Instagram. And these requirements that come from the real world, especially the logic that operates on these requirements, that is the business logic. But removing a digit from a pin that is not really dependent on the product, on the domain of our app, this would stay the same across different types of apps and software. But for example, if we have a to-do list app and we have a rule that we cannot mark a to-do as done if there is no due date set 
then this is a rule that we as the people who make up the requirements define. This is something that is very specific to our specific to-do app and might not apply to other to-do apps. So this is the very first thing that is super important to understand if you work with use cases. And you might now still think, okay, why is this class actually still not a good idea to create like that in a project? Because you still may think, okay, it's easy to test. It's, uh, it's very modular. It follows single responsibility. But actually about the last thing, mm, not really, I think. Because what is the responsibility of this class? You might now think, okay, the responsibility is dropping the last digit. But isn't that rather the responsibility of this drop last function? Since if something about the implementation of dropping the last digit changes, we would not need to make this change in this use case, but actually in this drop last function. And this function even comes from the Kotlin standard library. And this again tells us that there is nothing about this use case that suddenly makes this code more modular. Because why would we just add this class wrapper here with this execute function just to delegate the call to this drop last function? Why shouldn't we just use this drop last function right away at all the places where we need to delete a digit? The drop last function as a function itself is already modular and is already usable across the project. And we also don't really get any value from this use case in regards to testing as well. Because the only thing that we could really meaningfully test here is that we correctly call this drop last function and for example, not accidentally the uh, drop first function. But about the actual implementation of this function, you can be sure if the function comes from the Kotlin standard library that the authors of it tested it up to its last corner because every single Kotlin developer on this planet can use this function. So it's super important to thoroughly test this if you write such a Kotlin standard library function. And the thing is, if people just misunderstand use cases like this and end up with a delete digit use case, with a validate pin use case that really just compares to strings, for example, or something like here, an absurd to-do use case, which inserts or absurds a to-do into a to-do repository. The problem with these use cases is that they, in and of itself, don't do anything. All they do is they really just add an extra class to your product, an extra class you need to step into when trying to understand the code that doesn't do anything other than calling a function of another class. So here of this repository and here, not at all, but here of the Kotlin standard library. So you effectively made our project more complex without getting any of the benefits that use cases should really bring, right? So let's step away from these anti-patterns a little bit and understand what use cases were meant to be used originally. And for that, let's go to Google. And here I've already searched for a software development use case diagram, which is maybe a term you know from university. But if not, this is really interesting because the clean architecture use cases, we're referencing these software development use cases for which we have a very specific diagram case. So if you're planning certain software, then there is this type of diagram, like this one here, where we may have an online shopping system, for example. We have certain uh, stakeholders, that is what we call that. So people who are interested in this uh, software succeeding in different areas. And these stakeholders, these users of this uh, service here, for example, operate or these um, actually do certain high-level things. And that is the key word. Use cases should include higher level business application logic. And higher level application logic is something that should be in the requirements directly of your app. So for example, viewing certain items of an online shop, making a purchase, that is a piece of information that isn't always the same. It's, it, it definitely isn't always the same what it's like to make a purchase on different web shops. But no, we have to define this for our specific app, what making a purchase means. We have to define what checking out means. We have to define what registering a user or a client means. So all these things where a user is really faced with a specific, um, specific flow in your app they have to go through, that is logic that should be kept in the use case. However, if we again take a look at these um, anti-pattern use cases here, deleting a digit or validating a pin, that is nothing that a user would be really aware of when that happens. It's not like you have a screen and the user enters some data and they hit a button and the button just says, delete last digit. <laughs> That's nothing the user would really be aware of. It's just something that is part of this entire process, which happens in the background in order to just format data a little bit, but is not part of the higher level flow. And that higher level flow, that should be in the use case. So in other words, just things the user would do in the app and that they would be aware of happening. So what could examples be here? It could be saving a to-do. When the user hits the save button, they certainly know, hey, I'm currently saving the to-do. It would be registration. It would be exporting some kind of file. It would be showing some data, maybe grouped by date or so. 
It would be editing in a social network profile. It would be adding a friend on your social network. It would be making a post. It would be editing a post. All these things where the user knows what they are doing, when they are doing that, that is logic that should be in a use case. Because this is now really what business logic is about. It just defines which things, which function calls have to be called in which order in order to achieve a certain result, in order to successfully register a user, in order to successfully show the details of a to-do. So you may now think, okay, upsorting a to-do, isn't that a valid use case then? Since that's something the user is aware of, right? They may not think of it like upsorting, but they definitely know when they are saving a to-do. And yes, that would be a valid use case. But here we come to problem number two that we typically have on Android. Android developers, for some reason, love to work with repositories. So a repository is just a design pattern in software development that has the purpose to combine multiple different data sources and then just decide which data will then be forwarded, will then be returned, for example, here um, after upsorting a to-do. And that itself is a great design pattern. Since if we take a look in this to-do repository, this is really just an interface here. But if we take a look in the implementation, we have an offline first to-do repository here that operates on a local data source, on a remote data source, and on a sync to-do scheduler. So here in this case, I have a very rough architectural skeleton for an offline first to-do app. So where to-do items are both saved locally on the client side here in the app, but also synced to a remote server. So we can use this app across different devices, but still operate and, and work with it in offline mode. And if you have an offline first app, then this typically consists of these three types of um, data sources. Since for example, if we are upsorting a to-do, then we first of all want to um, upsort or insert this into our local data source in our room database, for example. Afterwards, we then synchronize this with our remote to-do data source, so with our API or so. And if that fails, because we maybe don't have internet connection or so, we say, okay, we want to actually schedule a sync. We want to say, okay, we make use of something like Work Manager on Android, which can be used to later on sync this to-do that couldn't be pushed to our backend because of a missing internet connection, for example, when internet is back. So these are all the things that upsorting a to-do consists of, or at least could consist of. And many of you watching this might not think, okay, this is effectively data logic because we talk to a local data source, we talk to a remote data source, or we possibly schedule a sync with Word Manager. That's all data logic that would never belong in a use case, right? Because use cases contain business logic, business logic is not data logic, but that's not fully correct. What data logic would really be is things like making an HTTP call, executing a database query, using Work Manager directly here and scheduling the sync with Work Manager directly. But if we actually take a look here at the import statements, then all those imports come from our domain layer. And the domain layer is simply meant to implement the domain side of our app. So what our app is really about. We don't really define any implementation details here in this offline first repository. So we don't have any Ktor networking client directly. We don't use retrofit here. We don't use room directly. All these things, of course, happen here under the hood, but they are hidden behind these abstractions. So we have a local to-do data source, or we can just absurd to-dos here locally. If we take a look at the implementation, this is now the place where we use a DAO that comes from the room database library. And here we really just uh, implement how the how the to-do would be saved locally with the example of room. We also have this remote to-do data source, which is just an interface. So not bound to any uh, specific implementation detail at all, just the specific implementation is. That is bound to Ktor. It implements how upsorting a to-do would work for our REST client, uh, how deleting a to-do would work, and so on. But these implementations, that's nothing that the offline first to-do repository would see here. So the code that we have here is essentially business logic. Or it can at least be seen like that. I do understand if people still say, okay, this is still very data-heavy logic because we still kind of operate on data sources. We don't yet know what kind of data sources or how these work under the hood, but we still operate on data sources. And this is definitely something that's debatable, um, but I also know many people who say this is clearly business logic. Something like a caching strategy, which this really is here, can be seen as business logic because it can be something that is specific to the domain of your app. And here really comes the improvement to use cases. If you work with use cases and you have certain repositories that have such real logic and that operate on purely on data sources, then this logic can be put in the use case directly and you can then get rid of the repository. So what we can do is 
in our absurd to do use case, which currently doesn't do anything, we, we wouldn't be able to test our code better with this. This is not more modular. It, it just, it's just an extra class that doesn't do anything. But what we can do is instead of this repository, we pass our local to-do data source, we pass our remote to-do data source, we pass our sync to-do scheduler, because that's all we need in order to really absurd to do. And then in our repository, we, we cut out all that code and simply paste it here in our use case. We swap out this name here to match, get rid of this here, and suddenly our use case contains actual logic and it's actually useful because now we have logic in here that we can test in an isolated fashion because we just need to initialize our use case class, pass maybe some fake dependencies, and we can test that this caching logic here is actually executed in the right order. And that, for example, um, if we try to sync our to-do with a backend that fails, that we successfully synced, um, uh, schedule a sync on the one hand, and that our to-do still appears in our local data source. Those are really valid things we can test now. And this is now something you can do for every single function in your offline first to-do repository. And after that, you can ditch this class. You can get rid of this repository if it just operates on these data sources here and uh, combines them. And this doesn't mean that having this offline first uh, repository here is bad. That's certainly a valid approach. But if you stick to having this repository, use cases on the other hand would be pointless. So it's either or. Either you stick to use cases and make them have extra logic, or you stick to this repository pattern and ditch the use cases and just reference the to-do repository right away, for example, in your view models. Because if you really structure your use cases like that, that they have real logic, then these can really be beneficial. Since also, even if you just have uh, one type of data source, let's say you just implement a local database and you don't have any um, API you're talking to, then sometimes it can still make sense to have a use case operating on that because it may contain multiple different types of local data sources. So you may have a local to-do data source and you may have a local user data source. So if multiple users could um, own multiple nodes or so, I don't know. And you now need to combine information from the to-do data source and the user data source, then you will again have two data sources where you would need to combine data, where you would have actual logic, and this would be perfect for a use case. Because in a repository, it, this, in my experience, wasn't always that clear. Because if you have a user repository and a to-do repository, which repository should you put in the logic that combines users and to-dos? Do you put it in the to-do repository or the user repository? None of that is really clear. Or use cases would also be perfect if for example, saving data has certain side effects. For example, um, whenever the user saves a to-do, you are actually sending this as an analytics event to Firebase Analytics. Then this is perfectly valid business logic that can belong in a use case because logging this event that a to-do was saved is definitely something that is specific to your app. It's not like every to-do app out there has exactly the same concept about saving a to-do. So it's perfectly valid to also log analytics events in here not um, with the direct implementation details themselves. So you wouldn't call the Firebase classes inside the use case, but rather hide them behind an abstraction, which use cases are then perfectly um, to operate on. So I hope this explained a little bit my view on why I'm typically not a big friend of use cases on Android because they're just so often misunderstood and how we can structure our code so that they make more sense. Again, this doesn't mean you have to structure your code like this in order to have a good architecture. You'll also notice that in my Essentials course, in the Android Essentials bundle, I'm not using use cases and we still have a very, very solid architecture that follows all the architectural principles that we need out there. Software development, after all, is not black and white. There is not the single best approach to structuring a project. And also, if you have multiple approaches, that doesn't mean that, they, that, that one of them must be better than the other. But what we can certainly say is if an approach is objectively wrong, and that is if it violates the essential fundamental concepts behind architecture. So modular design, solid principles, separation of concerns. And these fundamental principles, I really go over from the absolute ground up in the essentials course. That is why it's called essentials course, because once you understood those fundamentals of architecture and to building software, then any architectural principle, any architectural design pattern that you face out there will stick immediately because you understood the fundamental concepts behind those patterns. So again, 25% discount during Easter sale for one week when this video comes online. Link is down below. Check it out. Happy learning. And thanks so much for watching. I will see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye-bye.